Well, uh, so welcome to our talk. I'm uh, Josh Long, the uh, Spring Developer Advocate at Pivotal. And this is uh, a man who needs absolutely no introduction, my esteemed, the one, the only, the amazing Phil Webb, uh, one of the, the uh, masterminds behind uh, Spring Boot and um, you know, core committer and awesome, awesome dude. We are going to do the you know, present, presentation equivalent of a sort of, you know, what's it called, improv. We're going to just do the, do the code, no slides. So this might be a, a little bit of a bumpy ride, but uh, I think it'll be good. If you have questions, as usual, don't hesitate to just throw it up and you know, shout it out if you can. We're very eager to hear them. Anything to add to that? Uh, no, we, we, we're going to try and uh, do this talk in three bits, really. We're going to start with uh, covering some basics of Java config, just in case anyone's not familiar with them. Uh, and then we're going to go through a, a bunch of existing demo applications that Josh has uh, run through in the past many times and show you the Java config for those. And then finally, we're going to, if we have time, jump back and, and start writing our own uh, annotations that we can use within Java config. Yeah. Um, I think, the, I mean, the, the goal of this is to sort of, as the title implies, improve our Java configuration m muscle memory. How many of you have played with Java configuration thus far? Okay. How many of you love it? Okay. So a lot of this, hopefully, I mean, the, the, we're going to have some introduction stuff in the beginning. Um, it's for the benefit of the people who haven't. That's the whole point. And then we'll look at sort of what's, you know, Java configuration dot next. What's that next step, right? What does it look like to actually start using this stuff in anger, you know, to fully and completely move over from XML and to just use this where it's, but where it's available. Um, I guess we'll get going. Yeah. OK. Um, I want to start with, uh, can you guys see the screen all right? Is the font big enough? Yeah? Ooh. OK. Are you sure, guys? A <laughs> little bit. OK. Hang on. Plus the benefit of the YouTube video. I know that I had one workspace with the right font size. Hang on, what am I doing? <sighs> How many of you guys are just using the core Spring uh, Java configuration stuff? Okay. How many of you have used Java configuration in the context of some other project? Okay, a couple of you. That's good. Um, it's been an amazing year for Java configuration. 2013 saw the debut of uh, Java configuration APIs, or at least the milestone debut of Java configuration APIs for pretty much all the main flagship projects. So there's Little no, there's little excuse for like you know, uh, shutting away from it. It's definitely available. It's definitely easy to use, and in a lot of cases, it offers a, a super set of functionality because it, Java is by definition more expressive than the XML. So we can do a lot there. All right. So I've got what I've got here is like a really simple uh, demo application that's currently XML based. Um, we're going to try and transfer that to Java config and then try and talk through the bits as we go. Uh, so this is, we're, we're using a generic XML application context, just spin up a, a Spring instance, uh, grab a bean and run some method on it. I'll quickly show you the, the code that we've got. So we have a, a customer service, a transactional bean. We're injecting a couple of things into it. We have a, a data source and we have a, a message that we're injecting into it. And then uh, the run method just... Uh, prints out a, a little bit of information, the message that we've injected, and if we've got a data source, uh, the name of the database. So I've also got one other class uh, that's called a stupid platform transaction manager that just doesn't <laughs> do anything, uh, just prints out messages so that we can see that transactions are working. Okay. How many of you guys use the, uh, how many of you guys know what a platform transaction manager is? It's very easy to use Spring without actually knowing about it. It's, the, uh, it's our abstraction on top of transactional resources. It's, it's what is in play whenever you use add transactional on a service method. Um, and here we have just a mock one. All right, so here's our uh, XML. We've already got a lot of stuff here. Um, so let's have a look what we've got. We've got our main bean being created, uh, as usual, injecting a couple of things into it. Uh, the data source defined directly down here using this embedded database tag. Uh, we've got a message being injected here, and this is coming from the property placeholder uh, XML tag up here. So we're mixing up a number of different things in this demo just to show you that how the XML will relate to the Java config when we, when we start to translate it. 
So what I want to do now is, is start by creating a configuration class. Uh, I tend to favor the pattern um, when I have a main method of making that my configuration class. So a Java configuration class. Hmm. Got a kind of insist. We can disable that. I figured out how. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so uh, a Java configuration class is just a standard Spring Bean, uh, but you have to annotate it with this at configuration method. And to get this going, what we need to do is change the type of application context we're using. So I'm going to create an annotation application context. Annotation config. And I'm going to switch this over. And then rather than pointing it at the XML file, I'm going to point it at the, uh, the class that I've just created. You know what always gets me? That generic XML application context has been around for at least two or three rev revisions now. But I still use the old uh, class path XML application context. How many of you guys use the old one? Still works, of course. They just <laughs> they just haven't done a very good job of sharing, spreading the news. as a much more, uh, you know, clean uh, way to do it. It's cleaner. Okay. So the first thing I think we really want to show you is that you can mix and match Java config with your XML config. So uh, one way to get going, if you've got an existing app that you want to translate, is to just use this import resource annotation. So right here, I've taken out the XML from directly from my application context, and then I'm injecting my, uh, I'm telling it about my application. It's going to read that as a bean and then run this uh, annotation and see, see the file that we want to load. So if I want to just pipe that back in, Okay, so if I run that application, what we get is the, this is still running from the XML. We have this kind of message, which is hello from, coming from the properties file, the name of the database that we're injecting, and then because we've got transactions, we get the, the commit message. Obviously, we want to try and build this up and move it across. So we're not going to do that. We're going to try and start actually creating beans ourselves. So let's start with the first one, which is the... Uh, the custom service that we've got. <coughs> so I guess if you're familiar with Java config, we can kind of <coughs> try and fly through this as, as much as we can. Um, so the way that Spring works is whenever it sees this at configuration on a, a bean, it scans that bean for all the public methods that have uh, a bean annotated returns. So in this case, this is going to say, okay, I've got one bean, and I'm going to create it, and then that will be my, my bean that I get back out further down. And maybe we'll just hard code a, like a message in for now. So if we run this, Okay, the first thing to notice is we get, we're getting a stack trace. Um, no bean named my customer service is defined. Mm. So there's actually a bunch of conventions that happen. One thing you can do to fix this is specify a name directly on this annotation. But generally what we recommend is that you use the name of the method to represent the name of the bean. So if I rename this to my custom service, and rerun this application, this time we're kind of getting some response, we're getting the message out, but we're not getting any of the kind of database information, and we're not getting any of the transaction stuff happening. All right, so what's next in our, let's just flip back to the XML. Maybe the next thing we want to try, try and tackle is this injecting the message. And you see here, we've, we've got a property placeholder and we've got this property placeholder tag up here telling us that there's a properties file that's got this stuff defining it. Mm -hmm. And so here's the properties file with that hello from. So generally, um, when you're talking about Java config, there's normally some way of doing what you can do in the XML. And often it's fairly intuitive. Um, so in, in this case, it's an additional annotation that we need. Um, if I take a guess that it probably starts property, 
I can see that there's a property source annotation, and this will indeed give me uh, access to wire up that property. So I can just use the same syntax as I did in the other one. I want a class path, and it's called config dot properties. All right. So of course, we've now got access to the properties they're being loaded, but we don't yet have a way of injecting it. Uh, and this, this can be interesting. There's a number of different ways you can at attack that problem. Uh, but within the Java config, I generally prefer trying to get properties directly through uh, the environment abstraction. So I want an environment interface. And because, like I said earlier, the configuration classes are just straight spring beans. I can use all the kind of standard stuff that I would in any other spring bean. So I can auto wire that up. So auto wired, inject my spring environment, and from that I can take a look at it and, and set the message. So let's uh, change this test message here to get something from the environment. Environment dot get property, and then the key, the key's message. So. Sure. Um, if you have a custom property source, how would you wire that up? Uh, okay, off the, you know? Yeah, you, can, you, wanna con you can actually add an annotation, right? You've got that, or you can contribute it to the uh, environment. There's actually a, an interface that's pluggable, so you can use, for example, a map property source, and that just takes a map and extracts uh, keys and values from it and adds it to the environment, which then gets uh, rooted to by the underlying mechanism. Is that right? I think so, yeah. I think you, I think you can define a, an app bean method uh, with your custom source and it gets wired in. I'd have to double check the oh, exact syntax. Oh, does it, auto do, does it do, do it automatically? So. I think oh. so. We'd have to, we'd have to double check. But. Worst case, application.getenvironment. or configurable. You, need, you cast it to configurable environment, get property sources, dot add first, and that'll Yeah, you can add do that. All right, so. So here we go again, run this thing. We've, we've now got the, the property sources being wired up like we had in the XML, uh, and we're kind of manually doing this injection here. Okay, yeah, sure. So this, this property source here uh, is an annotation that tells Spring, add this file to your environment. So actually, environment can have a number of different property sources. Uh, so for instance, one thing you could do is, is add a property <coughs> source that takes command line arguments, um, or you can add it from uh, you know, files, or you could write your own, get it from or a database. From database. What it, you know, there's various different um, techniques that you can use. That's just a shortcut, right? That annotation is a syntax sugar for you know, add it from a file. Yeah, this, this is something that's so common that we, we and we, something we provide in the XML world that we, we kind of mirror it in the, the Java config. I have one follow-up. Mm. Is available from Spring 3.1 for most of this? Yeah, 3.1. Three, I'm actually using Spring 4 here, but I don't think, I'm, I don't think there's anything Spring 4 specific that I'm demoing, and I think it's 3.1 that, yeah. that Java config really kind of... Yeah, I think so. What, just show of hands, which version of Spring are you guys using? Who's using 2.5? It's okay, you're among friends, no judging. We've all been there. Who's using three? Okay, who's using three one? Right on. And then Anyone three, using four? Why not? <laughs> Guys, come on. Right on, dude. The, it's interesting, we've had Java configuration in Spring since 2005, not in the core framework, but as an ad adjacent project. Uh, then other projects like uh, Juice and that other, other white you know, dependency injection framework uh, came along. But, we had this for a long time, so it was nice to see that validated. When it was finally folded into the core in 2009, um, we sort of redoubled our efforts to make it even more awesome, and I think 3.1 is really where it hit its stride. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, so if we just like flip back to our XML, let's have a look at what we've done so far. Oh, I can't use your mouse. Uh, we have the, we've got the messages inserted. We, we haven't yet done the data source, so let's, let's try and sort that. Um, so this is a, another interesting element here because we've got we've got this little helper tag that's uh, kind of it's not like the annotation driven tag at the top where we're enabling functionality. Uh, 
it's, it's actually doing something for us. It's creating this data source. Uh, and these things often, the mapping may not be quite so obvious when you go to the Java config. So, we, I mean, we can take a guess that we definitely want a bean. And we definitely want it to be a data source and <laughs> not a Java X activation data source. What a lousy name. Um, so, I mean, one thing that's really nice about using the Java <laughs> config is you get all the kind of IDE tools for free. So you get your contents assist, you, you're type safe, you know what's going on. So quite often, if you're trying to do something, you can kind of guess. <laughs> um, so I am going to guess that it's something to do with the embedded database. OK, I actually know it's something to do with the embedded database, but pretend I'm guessing. So right here, you can see we've, we've got this builder class. So these builders are kind of mapping the functionality that's in the XML, but letting us kind of do it in code. So I'm going to do a. Whoa. I'm going to do a new database builder, and then I'm just going to kind of follow the chain. Set type that makes sense. Embedded database type was uh, HSQL, and then kind of one last method at the end to build it, and we're done. So that corresponds to the JDBC colon embedded database namespace element also introduced in 3.0 or 3.1. Uh, yeah, it's fairly recent, wasn't it? It's yeah. Keith Donald's awesomeness. Yeah, yeah. I think Ollie did cool. something like that. All right, so we've got a data source, we've got a bean. So the last thing we want to do is go back and inject it into our service. Wow. So this is quite an interesting feature with the Java config. Uh, it looks like Java code, and it looks like what you're doing is calling a method. Um, <laughs> But you're actually not. You're kind of triggering something else. Uh, so w when I said it starts, the, the system starts up and scans for these methods, that's one part of it. That, that starts to define beans that you're, bean definitions that you're going to need. And when Spring wants to create one of those beans, it's going to jump in and call this method. But when you call a method yourself, uh, it doesn't actually call that method. It says, hey, Spring, I want the data source bean at this point. So if I, the net result of this is I can just, I can just call the data source method. Um, I get the wiring behavior that I want. Um, but it, it, you kind of ought to be aware of it because it's kind of interesting. Let's, let's just run that and see if it works. Right, okay, so we've got hello from HSQL database engine, all great. Um, but the interesting thing here is, like, let's add a, just add some logging to this, just mm -hmm. simple logging show like I'm creating creating the data source, right? If I run that now, you know, make that a bit bigger, you can see I get the, uh, right above there, yeah. I get the create data source log message, and then I, you know, it's doing the stuff. If I call that method again, something interesting happens. Okay. I only get one log message, and that's because this is not saying call that method. This is saying spring get me the data source. And because that's a singleton bean, uh, spring's going to say, hey, I've already created that. Have the same one back again. So, I mean, you can really demo this. For loop if you want. Yeah, let's do a for loop over that. <laughs> right, let's call this maybe, uh, I don't know, 20 times. Shove that up there, and make, like, I'll stick a sys out here as well. Just, just print the i. Run that again. Mm. So again, you can see we created it the first time we injected it, and then we have kind of 20 calls, but nothing happens because that's the same bean being returned over and over again. Can I speak? Oh, yeah? Can you please go back to the XML? Sure. But not for too long. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Right. But on the Java config, I have to find out the right classes for this, blah, blah. So how do I go about doing that? Yeah, sure. I mean, you have to kind of learn <laughs> the same way you probably learned with the XML the first time around. Uh, you know. Can you the oh, oh yeah. sure. Sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, so I know how to do this thing in XML. Uh, how do I find the equivalent thing in the Java config? You know, is there any kind of documentation 
uh, that shows me a one-to-one -one mapping between these things. And I think there's probably some stuff in the reference guides, but um, I, there often isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between these things. But you're at the right talk. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're in the right place. That was the whole point. We're, there, there are some heuristics you can follow to kind of understand what to look for as you make the migration, right? There's patterns that we employ in Java configuration that map more or less to sort of patterns you'd expect in the XML world. So all the annotation-driven things correspond to the, have you showed the? Uh, uh, we haven't done the enable yeah. yet. We'll, show you, we'll show you some more stuff later with that. And you know, a lot of these questions get asked on places like Stack Overflow. So often if you like search for how do I do this XML in Java config, someone will answer that question for you. Well, I, can, I can think of why you guys and I can search the internet and spend like half an hour to get to the point. Right. So you what you want to like be able to like hover on this and have SDS kind of say make it Java config? Um, no, there's there's nothing like that. So first, you sir. Oh, profiles. You're in the wrong talk. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, did, <laughs> I actually did a talk exactly about that one yesterday, which is adaptive spring using profiles and, and, and so on. So. Uh, yeah, no, we're not we're not going to cover. We can, we can. I mean, we can mention it briefly. Half a second. But, um, that's what we do. But. I, uh, no. No. But there are patterns you can assume. Um, sir, in the back, left. Yes. Yes, it's the same underlying code that runs uh, with the Java config and the XML config. The environment has access to all the system properties and Java dot util Java dot properties and all that stuff already. Uh, yes, sir. So if you can go back to the proof, my application. I'm assuming that if you just uh, specify the data source as also wired inside the customer, so this you don't have to do all this, right? Uh, so the question was if we auto wire data source inside the custom service, will it, will it get picked up? It, you don't have to do all these uh, steps. Yeah, sure, okay. So uh, the answer is yes, you can, you can do that. What we're trying to focus on here is um, people that prefer to have a separation between their configuration and their, their classes. So a lot of people don't want to run auto-wired. They want to have no kind of spring interference in their code. Uh, and this allows you to have kind of a separation of concerns if you want that. But yeah, these are these are just standard Spring Bean. So once once this configuration is run, it's the same as any other Bean. And you can mix and match component scanning to achieve that with this, as well as XML and so on. Um, sir, over there on the right. Yeah, orange shirt. Sorry, first, moving to the right. I can. Yeah. So. It, okay. So the um, historically we had XML. XML is a great way to tell. Great XML provided us a great way to say, okay, here are the beans. Here are the properties for those beans. Here's the ID in which we by which we want to refer to the bean in the context. Um, and this XML document represents the the canonical representation of how all this stuff gets wired together. Then we introduced uh, circa Spring 2.0 some annotations when Java 5 became available. Okay, so the XML was because we didn't have any other way to tell the container about the metadata it needed to wire this stuff together. Java 5 gave us annotations and gave us the ability to add that metadata to our components in the code, and that uh, negated the need to have all this XML, in, you know, as much anyway. So now we can do a lot in just the X, in, in, just the, uh, through the annotation and component scanning. Then we had Java config because the problem with the component scanning is you have all these annotations littered throughout your code. Uh, Java configuration says, okay, I want a single canonical place to check the wiring of all my, uh, of all my components, but I want to use Java. It turns out, uh, much to, I think, people's shock, that Java is an absolutely great way to represent Java objects. It happens to be very good at it. So this is a, this is a great way to do that. You get the same benefits of using the XML, but you get the extra type safety and flexibility of the Java language. It is a single place to check stuff. You can still do component scanning as well, just as you could do XML and component scanning uh, also. I think that's true, yeah. Um, one thing to add probably is the, 
you know, STS gives you very, very good tools uh, if you're using XML-based config and Java config, but if you don't have STS or if you're just running in a vanilla IDE, the Java config is, is very searchable. You know, you can control click. I can see uh, what's this injecting. Imminently. Control click, boom, I'm, I'm at where I am. Imminently navigable, imminently testable. It's, you can debug through it. Um, and one last thing was, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, bummer. Um, Drats. <laughs> Escape me. You, sir, first, and we'll move back over, the right, over to the room here. Layer it. I mean, you take the same approach you would for, with XML. Me, if I have a web application, I'll have web configuration. I might import the service configuration tier, you know, and then that might import my repository. That, you know. Yeah, the whole purpose of this is assembling all my beans and wiring uh, in the same, right? It's yeah. the same thing as XML, just in Java code, and it compiles. The second thing is, though these methods, right, are public, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just thinking, like, I don't want to leave outside this class to access this method. So is it okay if I can make it as private? No, it's not, unfortunately. Um, but they don't need to be public, do they? Uh, the, the, the class doesn't need to be public. I think the class can be package level yeah. scope, uh, but the methods do need to be public because of the way that we enhance them. No, they don't? No. Oh, okay. But you can't have private methods, can you? You can't, okay. I stand corrected. You can have package level uh, classes and package level methods, and by the but way, you can't have private methods. The way this is working, dynamically, Spring takes this configuration class, subclasses it, right? So that witchcraft and sorcery you see where we call the data source a thousand times but only one instance is ever created. We achieve that by intercepting the call with a, dynamic, with a proxy, a dynamic subclass. So it's like we override the super method and then do a test. Is there a bean in the context that matches this bean? If so, just fetch it. Otherwise, create it by calling the super method, right? So that's why, you, that's why we have these sort of restrictions. We're doing subclassing at runtime. Yes, mm. Is it, if that helps. Uh, yes, you, sir, uh, on the left. I'm moving to the right. No, you. Um, so the question is, can can I get at the the black magic? You shouldn't need to, I guess, is the answer. Um, if you do want to have a look at it, there's a class called configuration something bean factory post processor, and you can go and dig through the code and see how we actually do it. But I'm, I don't really want to get into it in this yeah. uh, in this talk. Next. So you, you just mentioned that uh, you can debug easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Put a breakpoint. It's just Java code. Yeah, so can you actually um, maybe do an end of session and just run through, through the debug session? Uh, sure, sir. <laughs> the question is can I easily debug this and see what's going on? Um, yeah, the answer is uh, I can put, uh, maybe I'll put the, uh, the example back again with two data source calls and a couple of breakpoints. If I run this, for those uh, of you who had questions, hold on, we'll get to you in a second. Actually, can I try and field one while we were doing that? Yeah, sure. Next, uh, left, well, uh, the guy in the front first, and we'll go backwards. So this more or less eliminates the need for uh, all these abstract bean definitions, because you would basically just delegate to a common builder method that wasn't an at bean itself, but just used to build the common beans. Yes, and that reminds me of what I was trying to say about five minutes ago. Java configuration. Before, in order for us to change or tailor how Spring configures the bean, because remember, by default, Spring will instantiate the no argument constructor. If you specify arguments for the constructor, it'll pass those in. But there's no way to like do anything fancy. If you wanted to get a bean from some other place, like a JNDI context, you had to codify the recipe for doing so inside of something called a factory bean. Well, now we have. All we're trying to do is, if you think about it, we're trying to create a function that maps from, you know, what I want into the type that I need, right? So. That factory bean is no longer is quite as important. You can just create factory methods. Yeah. So that that's very nice. You can actually, if you don't want to look up something from JNDI, just do so. You know, you can actually use the JNDI object factory bean if you want, but um, it's very convenient. Okay. So uh, just quickly to answer that earlier question, here's here's the kind of break point stepping in. You can see some of the magic we've got with CGLib going on, um, but you can just step through this as you would any any other bean. Don't step through CGLib though. <laughs> that way lays dragons. Uh, Oh. Orange guy, because he's been so patient. No, one second. I have a quick question. Is there, are there any best practices around how many ad configurations you can have in one 
know my application. If I'm basically trying to instantiate three or four beams, would you recommend putting all of that here and just modify? Well, um, the answer, uh, the question is, uh, what's the best practice for uh, creating <coughs> configuration classes? Uh, and the answer is really, I, I guess, treat it the same as you do with with any other code that you write. If that class is getting too big, it's probably a sign that you need to split it up a bit. And we'll cover some of the the ways that you can. Uh, merge these things together in a, in a second or two. Gentleman with a hat. Yeah, so if your data source is in another configuration, what's the proper way to then reference that? Oh. Ah, okay. Couple yeah. of ways. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of different ways. Um, you want to answer that? You yeah, well, there's, you can do at inject in the configuration class or at auto wired in the configuration class itself. In your um, arguments, in the, in the arguments for the, the bean methods here, so if you have the uh, pu bean public custom service, custom service, I can declare an argument of the type that I want, and if I, if I want to disambiguate among multiple possible beans, I can simply use at qualifier just like I would with XML. So I can at, at qualifier for a specific type if I have, like, for example, two different data sources. And even better, I can actually just at inject. Well, put the at auto wired on the method, yeah. yeah. Um, I can even at inject uh, the entire configuration class. So I can just say at inject, you know, if I'm in web configuration, <clears throat> I can say at inject service configuration, and I can just call service, dot, service configuration dot data source. Mm -hmm. And those methods work the same way yeah. as if you call them inside your, your own app. So that's actually three ways that I can think of. Is there another one? Yeah, I think, I think the, the way that I prefer to do it is to inject the other uh, configuration class and call the methods. Yeah. But, yeah. but what if that, will that work if it's actually the parent context, like it's the root application context? You don't need to inject. You can just inject the application context. Uh, the question is, well, I'm, I'm not if sure. I'm, if I'm down in a web application context, I need beans from the root application context. Oh, okay. The question is, if I'm in, if I have two application contexts and I want to inject a service level um, auto configure, uh, sorry, a configuration class from the service level in my web level, can I do it? And the answer is yes. These are just straight up. Um, Spring Beans, so in the same way as you can inject services into controllers, if you've got that hierarchy, you can go up the hierarchy. You obviously can't go down the hierarchy. You, you have an at import annotation, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, let's, actually, let's, let's move on for a little bit. Otherwise, we'll, we probably won't get through this, Oof. Sorry. this, uh, this demo. And I think, um, I think we cover some of the import stuff a bit later. I can, actually, yeah. I, I can show that quickly now if you're interested. The, if you want to yeah. trigger one... If you want one <coughs> configuration class to load another, you can use this uh, at import annotation. So at import, and then you give the name of the other configuration class that you want, and Spring will then start with yours and follow the chain, follow any imports, any imports that that declares, and so on and so on. So, so you can use that to kind of split your code up a little bit. Oh, Dr. Phil. What about uh, XML? Yeah, you can mix and match that as well. Can you import an XML document? Yeah, we did that at the start. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Sorry. <laughs> I was tweeting about how awesome we were. All right. So I think we should carry on a little bit. Um, <laughs> good questions, guys. To? Yeah, thank you. So we've done some sounds. We've done... Okay, let's, let's have a look at the transaction stuff, because that's the, the one thing that we still haven't got in this, uh, in this <laughs> class. So this brings on to a kind of another pattern that you'll see quite common. And this is enable. So the uh, gentleman was asking, you know, how can you find out about this stuff? One thing that we try and do is be consistent through the code base. And one pattern that gets used over and over again is enable. So at enable will switch on some kind of uh, functionality. So you can see we've got a number here based on what's on our class path. And it's a good way to get kind of guessing, because at enable, OK, transaction manager, that looks like what I want that's going to switch on my transaction management. And that, what does that correspond to in the XML world? Oh, oh yeah, sure. That corresponds to TX annotation driven. And we have lots of different namespaces. So it's usually of the form MVC colon annotation driven, aspect J colon annotation driven, scheduling dot colon annotation driven, you know. And we have corresponding at enable annotations. Yeah, most of them have good, really good Java doc as well. So if you, um, if you hover on that particular element, most of them tell you what the equivalent uh, namespace in XML is, which is which is can be really handy if you want to make sure have I got the right thing. Sir, is there a reference somewhere that says this namespace is this? <laughs> I'm not aware of anything that sort of drags 
puts it all together, are you? Nothing specific, but no. as he just mentioned, the Java Duck does a great job, and uh, we'll see some of them today, so consider this part of a reference. You, sir? Have you guys either built one or thought of building a converter? I have thought about it, but it's like a, a, a bean XML to Java config cross compiler kind of thing or something. I mean, it wouldn't be. It would be very difficult to do, and I don't think you'd really get the, the, the complete benefits of, of it either. I'd prefer to. You know, I'd prefer that you start by importing your XML and gradually move things across yourself where you can you know, control how things work. Right, let's just run this for a second and see what, see what happens. OK, we've we got an exception. Um, because the, we have some conventions in the XML uh, that we don't necessarily, we have similar conventions in the Java config, but the, the XML is sometimes a little bit hard to follow. TX annotation driven here actually needs a bean with a specific name, and that name has to be Transaction Manager, and that has to be one of our platform Transaction Managers. And um, because we have got this bean in the XML, but we don't have it in our Java config, uh, we're getting that exception. So what I want to do is really just add that, that last bean that we need. It's nice that he's been able to add a bean uh, and the annotation will find it by type, so you don't have to have the same. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, like, f let's let's call it something else. Let's call it TX Manager in this case, and uh, return my what do I call it? Stupid. <laughs> New. Stupid platform transaction manager. I think. New. Oh yeah, yeah, that might help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. All right, so. We're, we're back now. This is now the equivalent in Java world from that XML. We haven't got that XML anymore. We've got the same functionality. I've left my logging in, but you can see we've got the, the hello message coming from the properties, getting that injected database, and the transaction manager support that we, that we had before. That's so awesome. Cool. So I think, uh, you wanna do you want to feel some questions and then switch it up? And <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Of, you okay. can show some of the other configs. Friend? Not, mm. from, a, from a practices perspective, is there a preference for Java config over XML and data? I would say that yes, there is a preference for Java config over XML, but there is absolutely no intention of getting rid of XML at all. Ever. Like it's, well, maybe in 20 years, I don't know, but <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not on the, on the radar and, and, at all. And actually, to, 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 just to say a little bit more, um, some, some things work better in XML. Um, I would say integration is, is probably an example where uh, it, it's sometimes easier to work in XML, but majority of the case, we, Java config is kind of the way it's going. As a D, XML is a great DSL, so it's a good way. We have namespaces that can pack a lot of punch. We try and make those available in the Java config world through uh, fluid DSLs and so on. But sometimes, when you just want to represent a graph or something like that, you can't beat XML. It just has a, it has the ability to kind of tokenize this kind of stuff easier. Um, it's great for visualization as well. Next. Uh, sure, yeah, hi. The, uh, I vaguely remember there being a preference in order, and I thought that uh, the XML overrid everything else. Is that still the case? So the question is, is there uh, a preference in order that, um, that things happen? So if, if you have um, XML and Java config mixed together, does one take preference over the other? I'm pretty sure it depends on the order that you do the imports. Right. I think the the... The Java config works in the same way as if you have two XML files and, and one overrides beans in the other. The Java config works the same way, and because you do the at import resource, it depends on the order that it finds things. I was just trying to figure out why, if you had that, uh, that transaction manager bean in the XML, why it didn't work. Oh, because I took out the import for the XML. So the XML, I could delete that file, that's gone. I was just starting afresh, so yeah, I probably didn't make that clear enough. Thank you. Uh, actually, in the front here. Um, in XML, we can use inner beans, like uh, just so that we only have 10 top level beans and then lots mm -hmm. of sub beans that we mm -hmm. nobody else really should care about. Can you do the same thing in Java config? Yes, you can. Or, well, you, you don't really need to, is the <laughs> answer. Um, because you d you, you're creating inner beans because you don't want to expose them as beans. So um, in this case, I just wouldn't have a bean method. I could just make this a regular method, and then it's not a bean. It's just calling the, the classes. You know what? 
being tracked through post processors and out of wires? Oh, okay. Then your only option, I guess, is this, the whether you make it public or uh, package scope to kind right. of indicate. The, Functions the as a mechanism want. of composability. Yeah. Not just using a Hibernate. So the question is, um, is there any performance impact between parsing XML versus um, scanning or parsing the, the class file? And uh, in practice, not, not that I've seen. Yeah, okay, so the question is, is it, is it advisable to, to mix and match Java config and XML while you uh, transfer to the, to the new start? And the, the answer is yes. I, I think that that's a very sensible way to go because, um, you know, ripping out your entire config may be a, quite a time-consuming job. So this gives you a way of the import resource annotation gives you a way of kind of working through that step Incrementally. By step. Yeah. And, and like you said, some stuff you may never ever convert for XML. Like Spring Integration works just perfectly there, you know? Spring Webflow, perfectly there. You can, uh, oh, yeah. you can stay. Um, yes, sir. Can you show how you can import the XML into Java? What if you need to go the other way? Like my reference stuff. Just <laughs> as long as you, so the beans are available by their ID, which is the method name, or as, as Phil showed, the uh, explicit ID specified in the at bean annotation, you can reference those in your XML configuration just as you would any other bean explicitly defined in the XML. Is OK? Uh, the question was, can I? take beans defined in my uh, Java configuration and reference them inside of my XML. Yes, you can. <laughs> Any others before we plow on? Yep. Uh, what is the equivalent of depends on attributes in XML? I believe there's an annotation. Yeah. Uh, it may even be part of bean. Voila. Uh, depends on. We have an annotation called depends on. And we actually have another annotation called at lazy, for example. Yes, yeah, scope is another example at, uh, that you can change. And then at scope. So all of this stuff works as you expect. If I have a, if I were to, disp I wouldn't ever deploy a request scope data source. But uh, were I to do that, I would. I, the semantics of scoping would be honored just as they are in the XML, right? That that's the benefit of having this dynamic proxy. It, if you inject a data source, it will always be the request local uh, data source instance. Sorry. No, they're not, because you can define your own scopes. So the question was, uh, why are the scopes not enums? And the answer is because. Uh, you can define your own scopes, and it depends on what type of application you're writing as to which scopes are available to you. Which reminds me of one thing, actually. You register scopes using a, something. There's an object, I forget, <laughs> like a scope exporter or whatever. I don't know. There's an object you have to configure if you want to register your own scopes, uh, and that brings up a great point. Certain types of beans need to run before everything else. Bean factory post-processors, as this gentleman just re reminded us, is, is one such example to... Uh, to set up a bean factory post-processor in particular, your method needs to be static. So some sort of bean factory post-processor. I don't think there's any other scenarios where that's true. Is that? Yeah, I think that's correct. So that's the only case. Because this, this bean will be run before the rest of the context is initialized. And this bean actually has the ability to look at the metadata, the bean definitions, before they're hydrated and actually become sort of real objects in the context. Uh, yeah. Can I fill up auto-wire environments and stuff into that? Should be available. Uh, I think you can at the, uh, at the argument. Um, argument level, yeah. I mean, obviously, you can't get at the environment instance in that case. Right, so that, that should yeah, still work. Sure that works. I can't even think of a bean factory post-processor, but uh, otherwise I'd try it. But yeah. point is, that's the only like, uh, caveat I would remind people of. This, we don't have to do that. And, like, there's no. You don't notice that happening in the XML. You don't notice the fact that this is being implicitly given precedence because of its because of its uh, a bean of a specific type. Okay, questions. Moving on. Right on. Now I'm going to switch workspaces here, and we shall see what we shall see. This code, by the by, is um just sort of a hodgepodge of all sorts of great demos and stuff from various projects. Uh, including the, and some custom code, of course, what, what Phil just demonstrated is uh, net new. And all of it lives on uh, github.com forward slash joshlong forward slash java config hyphen for the win, or FTW. Um, so if you want to play along at home, feel free. 
Uh, let's see. So what I kind of wanted to do now is we've established basic Java config. I think we're all sort of familiar with how to apply it. Um, once you understand the core mechanism, it, it becomes interesting to now actually use the APIs, the, the DSLs that these various projects provide. I wanted to do kind of a walking tour of some of these other fluid Java config centric DSL APIs that we have. Um, is that all right? OK. Um, you may not be using all these projects, but there's, there's so many great ones, it's just sort of a shame not to see as many as we can. Let's start, I suppose, with uh, the absolute most common scenario after just basic configuration, which is how to do Spring MVC, right? How many of you are, by show of hands, using Spring MVC? Me too. You guys are awesome. Um, so first things first, uh, in Java configuration, we actually have another, there's another nice thing. That, how many of you are in serverlet three environments? <coughs> right on. OK. So you can. Oh, right. Fair enough. Yep. File preferences. Do, ba -do, ba -do. Sorry? Are you sure on SEI? SEI? SE, uh, server yes. Yes. I was about to, yeah, thank you. I didn't know there was an acronym for that. <laughs> TIL, man. <laughs> TIL. You should all TV FM. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, is that legible? Visible? Maybe, yes, no, yeah. so okay, good. Okay, um, so the first things first, let's just start with a fictitious uh, class here. Ba -ba -ba. My, what do you, let me see, configuration. We are all about making things easy. Um, Spring has always been convention over configuration centric um, in that if you check certain boxes, you get these features for free. We have, in the core framework, very little opinion about whether you should use those check boxes, but they are at your, available, uh, at your availability, right? So if I create a configuration class, uh, and as Phil showed us with the uh, at enable transaction management, um, I can actually turn on Spring MVC as well, right? I can check the box and say I want uh, Spring MVC to be set up for me. Go away. <laughs> That's a terrible feature. Some third party plugin I have to root out and destroy. <coughs> Do you guys see anything else? Don't like you. Should do. So I can turn on Spring MVC, uh, and then when I do that, it does things conventionally. So the burden is on me to say, yeah, I want that. But once it does, once I turn it on, it does everything it can to get out of, its, get our, get out of our way and help us set up things. So in the, in the case of the at-enable transaction management, uh, the, the annotation automatically registered, or detected rather, the uh, registered platform transaction manager and applied it where appropriate. In my case, I'm gonna, if I'm setting up a web application here, I can use at enable web MVC. This corresponds more or less to MVC colon annotation driven um, in the XML world. Both of these do a whole heck of a lot for you out of the box. In point of fact, that's actually a working Spring MVC configuration class. We're done if you want to be, right? That's actually a huge step forward. Um, it automatically, by, by, by default, will look at the class path and detect certain kinds of libraries to turn on certain features for you. So for example, if you're building a RESTful service and you want to marshal back and forth between XML or Jackson, and you have uh, JAXB, the XML marshaling library on the class path, or if you have Jackson, the JSON marshaling library on the class path, it'll automatically register support for that. If you have commons file upload, the uh, very, very pr prodigious sort of uh, Apache commons upload for doing multi-part file uploads, uh, it'll automatically register support for multi-part file uploads as well. If you're in a servlet 3 environment, which natively supports file uploads, it'll automatically register support for that as well. Uh, it just go, the list goes on, right? So there's a lot of uh, sort of convenient assumptions being made for you by turning on this checkbox. You'll see that we've actually taken that sort of sensibility, that, that flexibility, that convention-oriented thinking um, to the extreme, right? We're, we're actually owning it now in a big, big, big way with uh, his brainchild, Spring Boot. So um, definitely encourage you to check that out and catch the replays of the video introducing that if you haven't seen it. Um, 
Okay, so this is a basic Spring MVC web application. I can actually leave it like that. I can do certain things just like I could in the XML. So for example, if I wanted to, over, if I wanted to configure my own um, view resolver, right? A view resolver is a strategy interface in Spring MVC. It's what's used to turn a abstract string, an abstract uh, view name, like, like, like uh, welcome or home page or whatever, into a view, right? It routes and it, it, it's the one that gives you a view instance, a view concrete instance given that name. Um, so in my case, I want to be able to have a view resolver that resolves the string foo into a JSP page, right? So uh, I can do, uh, right, so you could do the same thing inside of core, um, what is that? absolutely not what I want. Did I do something wrong here? Hmm. Am I doing something really wrong? Invalid character constant, sure. Return. I think it's internal resource, maybe. Resource, uh, there, uh, there we are. Internal resource view resolver. Uh -huh. Okay, now we're cooking. So for example, new internal resource view resolver. Just rolls right off the tongue. IVR dot, whatever, set prefix web inf. Views, IVR dot set suffix dot JSP, and then re return the IVR, right? So there you are. So that when that bean is registered in the context, um, that will be automatically delegated to whenever inside of a Spring MVC controller you do something like return a string. So if you had a Spring MVC controller method, this is a hypothetical. I'm not actually writing code here, but you know. Request mapping. This doesn't belong here. Put it in another class. Uh, string, foo, whatever. When I return foo in my controller um, inside of a Spring MVC class, that delegates to that view resolver and picks it up. So you can override the machinery that way. There's some beans that, as in XML, you can just automatically register and that overrides the defaults. Uh, you can e go even further, of course, by extending a a uh, template class, a configuration base class. So extends, well, here, web MVC configuration, configure adapter. Okay, so this class here is an abstract class that uh, implements an interface for us so that we don't have to implement uh, uh, all the interface methods for it. You know, it's like, um, it's just an abstract class. It, it implements web MVC configure. Web MVC configure itself provides callback mechanisms, callback methods, uh, during which you can register certain types of components as you like, right? You can override them. So if I, for example, want to register a custom HTTP message converter, I just override that method and register, you know, contribute it to this converters collection. If I want to override which uh, validator is in play, I can override this method. You know, you have a lot of, if I want to con configure the specifics of asynchronous servlets, I can override that method. You have lots of opportunity to tailor the machinery as it's being constructed. Right. Yeah, and one of the nice things about, if you look at the, the enable annotation, it, it gives you hints as well as to ways you can do things. So if you follow the chain, if you know that you've got enable web MVC, mm -hmm. which most of our demos have, you can read the Java doc, read about the configure uh, adapter, and then once you're in here, of course, you get all the benefits of Java, again, code completion and what have you, to, to find the methods that you might actually want. Exactly. Right, so, um, for example, I could contribute this. Doo -ba -doo. Right, and that would be, I don't need to call super because super is just an empty no-op, okay? But 
uh, it's just nice to know that I have that opportunity by extending that base class. And then Spring MVC will do the right thing, look at, that, look at those contributions and make sure that uh, you know, everything is set up the right way. If I wanted to configure my, beam, my, my uh, HTTP message converter independently, I could, for example, um, oops, do so by injecting the HTTP message converter that I want to contribute. Maybe I have a specific one like that. And then, you know, converters add this dot, this dot conf. Okay, so that you have a lot of, you can do a lot of things here in these callback methods. They're very powerful. That's, this is one way to go, but I, get, I would argue that this is a little too verbose, even for me. I mean, I've almost written four lines of code, and that is, I don't get paid enough. I just don't. So, uh, yeah, we can do better. There's actually, because if we do this, this is the servlet configuration for Spring. Uh, but we still have that pesky, pesky web.xml to take care of. Uh, so we've actually got uh, something called the servlet, con servlet context initializer, or servlet container initializer, which is a callback that works on servlet 3 or greater uh, you know, servers. So for example, Tomcat 7, which has been around for four years now, um, supports this, this mechanism. And it is the programmatic Java equivalent to web.xml. Okay? Uh, I won't show you how to do that because we can do even better. Right? That, that is also a callback you know, subclass type thing where you have to override something. I want to get two for one, right? I'm bargain hunting for, for easy configuration. Uh, Spring provides a great editor where I can use to delete this code, first of all. Goodbye. Nobody cares. And then I can actually take advantage of something called a abstract annotation config dispatcher servlet initializer. <laughs> <coughs> Obviously. Um, we have a policy now of naming all our classes so long that you can't tweet jokes about them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, high five. Bump. So good. <laughs> um, so, this, so this is a twofer, right? This does two things. It actually sets up the servlet. It does web.xml. All you have to do is actually leave the class on the class path, and the servlet 3 container will ultimately make sure it gets picked up. Then. Spring, which you know, Spring is in play here too as well because we're extending a Spring base class. The Spring base class provides template methods. These template methods just ask you certain questions. Again, just tick the boxes. You know, check the, fill out the form, and, and, and you get what you need. If you think about the way typical Spring MVC applications are, are layered, you have the context loader listener. That's a ser servlet container listener. Okay, it's an implementation of that that kind of component. It provides. Uh, that's where you keep your global beans, right? Your services, the data sources, things that you don't want to recreate for each dispatcher servlet. As we talked about earlier, that lives as a parent context, okay? Um, so you want to have all the service tier stuff live there. So I say, okay, well, my service configuration, that should probably be registered here. And then for my web configuration, I can register one to n uh, servlet config con classes, right? Including my uh, web MVC configuration class down here, where I'm actually registering you know, servlet three uh, multi-part re resolution. Um, and this is the equivalent of registering an application context for each dispatcher servlet. And remember, you can have one to end dispatcher servlets in your application. You might have one for uh, Spring MVC, just a web application. You might have yet another for, uh, for um, uh, re a REST endpoint. You might have another for Spring Webflow. You might have another one for Spring Web Services, et cetera. So dispatcher servlet, you could definitely have a lot of them. And you want to have a little bit of isolation. So each one has its own context but they can all see upwards, if you will. They can all see the context loader listener global beans. Okay? They all share the same parent context. So what I'm saying here is I have one dispatcher servlet that I want to register, and it should have this configuration class in play. I want to map everything to forward slash. I want to register certain types of servlet filters here, like multi-part filter and hidden HTTP method filter. And because I am picky, I want to uh, tailor the registration of that servlet uh, in particular, I want to tailor the way the servlet 3 container stores the files that I upload using multi-part file upload. So I have a callback here called customize registration. This class alone sets up everything. Well, that and this little code here. This class sets up Spring MVC. It does web.xml. It sets up the dispatcher servlet. It imports your global beans. This is everything. You've got a working Spring MVC application you know, for what I would argue is mind-bogglingly mind -boggling, like simple API, right? You can't, so this doesn't actually have an equivalent in the XML world. There is no way to get both web.xml and your Spring XML in one, one swoop, right? Um, 
These things are additive, by the way. So if you have two of these on the class path, they both contribute to the ultimate you know, running application. And all, the, all that machinery gets contributed to the application. So for example, uh, it's not uncommon for a library or a project from, a, from the Spring stack to contribute its own initializer that you can use, right? a base one that you can override and extend, just like these. And that way, for example, uh, in Spring Security, we can contribute stuff that you need to set up. Right? We can hide all that from you. You don't have to worry about manually registering the, the Spring Security filter chain, for example. Right? Let, the, let, let the project do it for you now. It's, it's almost, you know, it's almost too easy. Um, so we're going to go some batch. Yeah. OK, so that's Spring MEC. Let's see what else we got here. We've got a lot of different examples I want to show you so we get a feel for stuff. Um, batch. You guys want to see some? Who's using Spring Batch? Awesome. So uh, Spring Batch has, uh, you guys saw Dr. Sire's uh, <laughs> keynote a couple of days ago. He, he alluded to the fact that he had been one of the strongest proponents of XML, uh, but he's been working with Java configuration for the last six months and dot, dot, dot. He didn't miss it, you know, um, didn't miss XML. Uh, Dr. Sire, among his many, many, many amazing credentials, is one of the uh, founders of the Spring Batch project, which has a very nice, very, very elegant uh, XML based DSL. Spring Batch, uh, for those of you who, aren't, who haven't played with it yet, is um, an API to solve an age old problem, which is I want to do batch processing. If I, you know, you could. We've all been there before. How many of you have written something where you like read in data from a from a, a file system and load it into a database? At, you know, it runs it every night, midnight. It's okay, guys. We we've all been there. We all tried it once in college. Who's done it? Come on. It's, it's, sometimes you have to write a cron job. That's the way of, the way the world works. Um, Spring Batch makes that ETL kind of stuff very very easy, right? It's very 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 powerful. Um, however. I'm very happy to report that um, in the last year, both uh, Dr. Sire and Michael Manila, sitting over there, uh, have done oh, just a bang up amazing job of providing a nice Java configuration DSL for this API. So I think the, it's GA in 2.2, 2 .2, right? Yep. yep. And uh, of course, it'll be forwardly compatible in 3, of course. So if you want to use Java configuration, you can. Um, let's take a look at that. Data and services. So here's an, a batch configuration class. Uh, the idea is, here's the idea. We have common things that you need to support just, Spring Batch, right? For just go to the top a sec. I want to see the enable. OK, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you have at enable batch processing, just as before. Again, we're turning on Spring Batch. We're saying, I want that. Please you know, turn on that. Um, and you don't actually technically need that in this case, but it's a nice, convenient thing if you have uh, multiple jobs that you want to have isolation relative to the global context. <coughs> Um, here are common beans that I need for Spring Batch to do its work. It needs to know about what database to talk to to consult its metadata tables, right? Spring Batch requires uh, several different RDBMS schema tables uh, to be able to store the metadata associated with running batch jobs. So I have a database here uh, in which, yeah? Any more? Okay. Enable, 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 yeah, enable batch processing Oh, goody. Let's see. I think I had that for a reason. I think I had another bean that was using a transaction manager. OK. Um, here's another. There's a kind of an interesting. So the idea, OK, I'll show you this, guys, from the beginning, and we'll step backwards. Where's the bottom of the code here? This is what it all amounts to. Is that amazingly uh, beautiful little line there? Just I'm loading a job, right? I want to create a job. A job contains one to end steps. Each step contains an optional item reader, an optional item processor, and an optional item writer. So the item reader reads something from a data source. The processor might do something like change it or enrich the data. And that gets passed to the item writer, which then writes the ultimate data out to something. Okay? So it's a chain. It's just like step one, read, write, repeat, right? and on until uh, uh, infinity. And we provide, uh, out of the box, lots and lots of great implementations of both the item reader and item writer imp imp interface. And uh, so you don't need to very often write your own. Hello. Wait for it. Internet, come on, internet. Daddy needs a new code page. Come on, internet. Oh, we're not online. This won't go anywhere. <laughs> Lies. OK, who's ever downloading stuff, get off. OK, seems better. Doop -doop. Oh, 
Is it? Me. Hey. <laughs> Somebody's got to be connected. Go away. Upgrade to OS 10, where they introduced Twitter and Facebook has ruined my life. You have no idea the most awkward things I get pop up in the middle of presentations. <laughs> um, Ted, sorry. Sorry? Reader. Yeah, thank you. Oh, good idea. Item, reader, voila. Hmm. Really? Just hit four, you get class names at least. Oh, yeah, there you go. Oh, thank you, sir. So, yeah, here's a few implementations that are provided out of the box supporting things like reading from JMS and from uh, AMQP. And we have things for XML documents for common delimited or tab delimited kind of uh, tokenized documents. We have lots of great things that you can read and work with there. So, you don't need very often to write your own, but you do need to sort of configure and you know, tailor these beans to support your use case, right? You might have specific settings. So, the goal is for each job, I'm going to. What is this? I'm going to, this is a string, okay? So I'm just creating, that's the bean, that's the job ID. I'm keeping all this stuff in one place so I don't have to repeat it in certain places. Um, I go down to my job. It's a flow, it's got one step and I'm, in, I'm injecting that step in the here, right? I could, in theory, I could just call the configuration method and get the step like we did before. But a lot of these, uh, a lot of my bean definitions here have arguments that I'm expecting the context to provide when it configures my, uh, my bean. So I would have to pass those arguments in. So I'm not doing that. I'm going to go ahead and just have Spring inject the bean for me as an argument, even though, that's, even though that bean is more than likely just defined right here. Actually, it is defined right here. So this is the step, OK? The step, uh, you can have one to many of these, right, per application. Um, and then these steps need an item reader, like I say, a processor, and a writer. Okay. Once you have that, you can get access to the uh, step builder and then just build, right? You have a reader that reads um, data and creates a customer object out of it. And then that reader forwards data to the processor. The processor does whatever it needs to do with it and then it forwards that to the writer and then you're done. So that's kind of a callback fluid DSL way of configuring a Spring Batch job. Um, each of these item readers and writers, I'm disambiguating by using the string name, right? That's what these are. These are public static final strings that I've kept at the top of the class so I can refer to the ID and that way there's no confusion by the context, no confusion by Spring as to which item reader I want where. You can, you can start to see the common patterns that are coming out, that this yeah. builder is looking very similar to the embedded database builder that we had earlier. We've mm -hmm. got the enables. So most of the Spring projects are trying to follow a kind of consistent style at least. Yeah. Is there any reason that you're not just calling these directly? Yes. as I. Uh, tried to articulate a second ago. Uh, the reason I'm not calling them directly is because they require arguments like these. And I have, it gets weird because you have to, somebody has to have that argument, right? Somebody has to provide it. And if it's not Spring, it means it's me. And I don't have them on hand. And I can't really get them on hand from the call site. So I'm just using type based injection. Um, here's a, you know, we have, for example, a shortcut for a scoped bean, right? So this bean is a, item reader, but it's scoped specific to each step. So this, gets, this bean gets recreated each time the job, and then in particular that step, gets created. Okay? And that means that this at value annotation gets re-evaluated every time the bean is created. And then that expression looks up uh, you know, in the uh, parameter that was passed to the job when the job was launched. So I can now get the latest and greatest. You know, it's re-evaluated each time. So that way, if I launch a job, I get the actual uh, parameter. right? And all this is, by the way, is the file I want to actually read from. That's why I want that. I want the one that was just passed to this job, not the one that was created when I configured the application you know, two, two weeks ago before we launched it. You know. So uh, I think we've got maybe about 20 minutes left. Is that right? Yeah, we've got to go more. So do we want to, I mean, we can kind of take this any way you want. We can carry on looking at through, through some more mm -hmm. uh, configurations and show you the patterns there. Uh, or we can, we can go and try and write um, what can I show? A couple our more? own. Uh, enable annotations. So I think I don't think we'll have time to do both. So if you if there's some particular preference, please, please shout. Let me. May I just introduce one more API? Yeah. Okay. okay. And then we'll. I definitely want to get that too. So, so batch is a very good example. Um, Spring Social, Spring Data, Spring uh, Security, um, Spring Security OAuth, 
uh, Spring MVC, Spring HadOS, Spring Data REST, all these things have Java configuration APIs. And they look more or less kind of like what we're looking at here now. Here's an example of using Spring Social I particularly like. Um, where is the social one? Up here. It is social security. Oh, social security. Voila. Really? Okay. Where? Config. So this is a showcase example. We've had this on the Spring Social examples under the uh, github.com forward slash spring projects repository. And what I've got here is these very convenient annotations. I've got at enable Facebook, at enable Twitter, at enable LinkedIn in which I've configured my client ID and my secret. Right? This is stuff you get when you register to create a new app with Facebook or Twitter or whatever. It's pretty much the same. It's basic OAuth, right? Um, and it's very declarative. I can just say, yep, store my, store my OAuth connections and credentials in a JDBC repository for me. Thank you. And uh, make it so that I can just say at inject Twitter operations in my controller. And that Twitter operations will be scoped to the currently authenticated user in the Spring MVC web application. Same thing for at enable Facebook, same thing for at enable LinkedIn, et cetera. So it's a very common pattern. And then from there, all I have to do is register a couple of controllers that I want Spring MVC to have uh, to manage the, what is called the OAuth dance. Okay. Um, what else? I guess that's, I mean, any questions on this stuff? I'm just trying to show you that there's, this is kind of a pervasive pattern. If you can understand it in one place, it becomes very easy to start looking for the at enable in another place. Yeah. Uh, type more general in the Java context. It, it seems that you very often have the pattern you do new foo, foo.setA, foo.setB, foo.set, and then return foo. Can you write Java context in Groovy because that would be more readable? I believe you can. Yeah, um, why not? I don't yeah, know. Are you I, sure? I don't think there's anything special about the. By the by, the, you, actually in Groovy, you might just use a Groovy beam builder. As, as Phil re referred to earlier, um, Spring doesn't give two licks about where it gets the information about your, your objects. It needs to know, <clears throat> for it to do its job, it needs to know which type of class you want to instantiate and how to satisfy dependencies, right? Which properties need which, which references and which objects. It doesn't care if you get it from XML or from component scanning where it automatically sort of infers that structure for you uh, or if you get it from uh, Java configuration or if you get it from the Groovy Beam Builder or if you get it from the Spring Scala DSL that we provide, which is a different way of configuring stuff as well. You could theoretically write your own mechanism that reads from .ini files. You know, it really doesn't matter. At runtime, they're all just one giant big bag of beans. They all can take advantage of AOP. They can all inject references to each other. They all see each other. Um, so you, you know, at runtime, they're all the same thing. They get canonicalized into something called a bean definition at runtime. Uh, so yeah, choose your style. You can mix and match is the point. That's why it's so easy to use XML and Java configuration and component scanning and the Groovy and Builder and the Scala DSL all together if you liked and you were crazy. I was thinking of the at bean annotations and all the various at lazy and so on. Well, that would still be able to apply that on Groovy methods? I, I think you should be able to, but again, in the Groovy world, I, I think the recommendation is the Bean Builder itself. Uh, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? Okay, um, so that's kind of the API. We don't, we're running short in time, and I really want to show you the next bit. So. We'll switch over again. Yep. And, right, okay. Questions on that stuff while he's switching over? I encourage you to take a look at the Spring Security. Actually, this. Oh, wait. Show the Spring Security. Oh, ah, too late. Too late. Bugger, too late. Know. Damn. The Spring Security API is the one I think is the most interesting. It actually provides a, a very, very sexy uh, uh, fluid DSL for doing the stuff that used to take reams and reams of code or XML. It's now, I mean, now you can do Spring Security fairly. Uh, concisely, but still, it, it just feels better in the Java Configuration API. You can actually register a form. You can actually say, I want sign in and sign out support. I want to have a, a challenge form presented whenever somebody's not authenticated. I want them, I can say, I want OAuth to be set up, and I can do all that inside of basically a callback. Right? So it's a fluid DSL. You call methods and then chain those method invocations together, and it becomes very easy to configure stuff. It's like XSD, you know, the auto-completion here actually is documentational if you will, right? The, because of the chaining of the method invocations is um, so obvious. You have that on your GitHub? Yeah, it's all, there's, there's a Spring Security example in there, Spring Data REST, Spring HideOS, Spring Security OAuth, Spring Social, Spring Mobile. There's all examples in that code. And I was hoping to cover all that stuff, but you guys asked so many awesome questions that it was, you know, 90 minutes just isn't enough. Next time we'll do a six hour one. Yeah. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting old. What, what did you say? There's a REST example of the mode for empty, so I just want to make sure you 
oh, it's a, oh, the REST examples and all those things are submodules. They're Git modules. So you have to do Git uh, init or whatever. That uh, Yeah, we should probably have a read me on that. I, so yeah, so I'm so sorry about that. You're absolutely right. They're not empty. They're just references to other projects that I maintain in earnest. And they're being linked into here because they're good examples. The Spring, I should, in theory, just link to the uh, Spring social example as well like that. All right. So. Um, just trying to fly through this. What I wanted to do now was kind of show you the mechanism that we use internally to write these at enable um, annotations. I, I thought it might be interesting, you know, if, if you want to write your own at enables, they're really not very difficult to do. This um, is more for the framework architect perspective. You want to provide some sort of mechanism that you can reuse, you know, for other people. So, um, yeah, indeed, right. The, the, so the first thing that um, I just want to do is like knock up a, a simple um, <coughs> annotation, enable my stuff, uh, and you know, use the usual Java uh, extra meta annotations that I need to say, keep me around at runtime. You can stick it on a class file and uh, generate Java doc for it. So if I wanted to actually kind of take my, uh, my application and let's, let's just delete all this and, and do something a bit simpler. So I'm going to keep the configuration thing, but delete all the other mm -hmm. code. OK. So I wanted to show you the import uh, annotation. So I'll, I'll just start by doing that. I'll create like a my config class, put the configuration back on that. And we'll just create like a simple beam with just that one message in. Uh, my. All right. Type quicker. Type quicker. So okay, what I've what I've just done here is create a new config, and uh, I've I've still got the old config, but I've ripped out everything from there. So if I want to have one chained up to the other, um, what I can do is use that import annotation. So not import resource, that's for XML files, but import uh, itself, and then the config that I want. So I'm just going to go my config dot class. So with a bit of luck. So that, that'll run, and we're now picking up that other config and uh, just sticking out that simple message, and we've got rid of all the data source stuff. What's the priority on those? Is that, does the my config come in and then it applies to the my uh, I, Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, it follows the import chain first. And these can actually be in a, this is actually an array. Like The nice thing about the, um, the annotations in Java is that you can, you can either, if you've got a single element in one of these arrays, you can just define it. But you can actually like, chain these together. They're quite, they're quite nice. So um, what you might not realize is that, that actually this import command can be used um, as a meta annotation. So a meta annotation is just an annotation that you put on another annotation. So in this case, we could have the enable my stuff annotation that I'm writing. And I can put my import on there, um, which is quite a nice little feature. It just means that you can kind of write something that's meaningful and, and usable and kind of hide the details of how you do it um, behind, this, behind your own code. So like, if I run that again, I just get exactly the same result. So are you saying that there's absolutely no magic be between the at enable annotations that Spring projects provide and the ones you can write? They're exactly the same, yeah. OK. There's no reason you can't use it as a mechanism for reuse in your team as well. So, I mean, that, that gives you kind of a basic flavor of what you can do. But often, uh, you might want to provide arguments on those annotations for things that you need. Um, so I just want to quickly show you how you can, let's define something on this, like a, let's just define a message for now. Uh, I'll just use a value. So my, um, my application is now failing because I need to put something on. So let's, let's go like. Josh. Hi. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so what I want to be able to do is kind of, 
I want that import to happen, but I want to be able to intercept that, that um, metadata that's on the class that I actually use. So what I can do is create a new class that's going to have that responsibility of handling that additional step. I'm just going to call it uh, importer for now. So if I go back to enable my stuff and change it from directly importing my config to importing this, uh, this additional class and then run that again, what, okay, what we get is an exception. Um, and if I fold it, roll over a little bit, you should be able to see that it's saying, okay, you try to import something, it wasn't a configuration class, right, okay, it doesn't have any B methods, yeah, I know, and it doesn't implement one of these two things. So these two uh, interfaces, import selector and import bean definition registrar, are ways that you can um, get in there and do your own stuff. So I'm going to start with import selector. So import selector is a really simple interface. Implement. Uh, let's add the unimplemented methods. So it, it, what it effectively does is give you one method, um, I'll come back to the argument that it passes, and you give it a bunch of string outputs, and the string outputs are things that you want Java config to import. So like I, let's just, for the sake of simplicity, return the, uh, the thing that I already had, which was my config. We have time, 10 minutes, okay. And the reason you're returning a string is because this stuff isn't supposed to be it may not be on the class path, or you know, the reference isn't, you know, no guarantee to be concrete by the time it gets reused, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you can return. Actually, I think from these ones you can return XML as well. So if I if I run that again, hopefully we should see. Yeah. Okay. We're back and running now. But I've got access to this additional stuff, um, and this additional stuff is is metadata on the configuration class that I wrote. So. What I can do is actually get access to uh, things that I might find interesting. And normally what I want is annotation attributes for the annotation type that I defined. So in this case, enable my stuff. So let's just assign that to a, a map for now. So. Maybe I can just sit out this, see what happens. All right, so so you can see here what I've what I've got is this additional access to the stuff. So I could, I can take what's what's come into me and then uh, make decisions about it. So finally, I have value. In this case, <laughs> in this case, like I I might uh, want to have maybe two different config files, and maybe I switch on a boolean or something. Um, often import selectors, uh, it, it depends on what you're doing, it can be useful, but often you might want to actually do the, the mechanics of wiring up the bean yourself. Uh, so like in this case, let's, let's maybe make that, um, make that attribute that's coming into us the name of the message in the bean. Um, now I can't easily do that because the, the my config is, you know, there's, there's no easy way of like hooking that in. So I have to actually wire that bean up myself. So what I want to do, I'm just going to delete that class. Goodbye. And then we should be getting an error here. And then I'm going to change this import selector to the import, whatever it was, being definition registrar. So just to compare the methods, they're pretty similar. One gives you the, the result is the things that you want. The other doesn't return anything, uh, but it gives you this bean definition registry, which you can use to register your own beans. Now that, by the by, is one of the objects that you want to get at. If you're doing a bean factory post-processor, which as I mentioned before, runs before all the beans are actual instances and while they're still just metadata, um, that kind of uh, that bean definition registry is exactly what you want. And uh, having that ability to get at, it, get, at it, get at it in here using, the Java, using a Java configuration API is very, very convenient. You can actually register your own bean definitions programmatically now. So if you think about Spring MEC or Spring Security, which has whole slew of beans that we need to support the promise that, that pr the, the framework provides, you know, the, the goals of that framework. Those beans are programmatically registered using one of these. 
So even though you turn on one annotation, you might get 50 beans, you know? This is from the start of uh, yeah Java config, I think. Uh, whenever was it three one? Did we decide three one? Is, yeah, that's the well, when we had at enable. So that was three one. Yeah, this has definitely been there from the start of at enable. This is not um, nothing new for uh, in four or anything. All right, I'm just gonna quickly get that value attribute out. I realise we're running out of time a little bit. All right. Uh, so here what I'm doing is, uh, I get rid of that sys out, just creating a bean definition, which is like, this is effectively what Spring does under the covers. I want a definition of a bean that is my customer service, and then I want to inject into the message property the value that I've got from my annotation. And then I can just uh, use the registry to register the bean definition, which I think we have to call my custom service and the definition. All right. So hopefully, if I run that, so this time around, I, I'm getting Josh as the name of the bean. So I, I can do anything I want with this stuff. Um, let's just, as a final kind of example, show you that, like, Josh and Phil. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. So I think that's. I think we're pretty much at time. We've probably got five minutes for questions if you want to. Wow. What is it? Don't all raise your hand at once now. You in the back. You're just stretching. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, I had a question about the, those proxies at CGLib. Uh, so CGLib <coughs> used to be sort of, or, or the preferred mechanism what used to be the uh, dynamic proxies. I think that's what the documentation says. Now it seems with with Java config, we are using CGLib. And I thought somewhere else in the documentation, I read that once you register like CGLib, it will use CGLib everywhere because it's a stronger proxying mechanism. Uh, so the question was, uh, I see uh, CGLib is now used by Java config, and does that mean that it's used everywhere? Um, the answer is, actually, we repackage CGLib now, so you don't need to include it directly on your class path. It's already there. and I, I I think what happens is we will use CGLib when we want to proxy classes because we can't do it with Java. Concrete things. classes. Concrete classes. Not right. interfaces. Right, exactly. And for interfaces, we still use um, Java proxies. From what I heard from the last session, is that uh, if the, we have a bin, it doesn't give from any interface that we have to be with CGLib. Right, yes. Okay. Well put. Other questions? Hello, sir. So if you're inheriting your Java configuration, say you have multiple dispatcher servers, so mm -hmm. they all need some... <coughs> Global service, data source thing, yeah. Yeah, common bean stuff. Uh, will it actually scan for at bean uh, annotated methods in inherit classes? Uh, so the question is, will the... Um, will application config scan for bean methods in parent config? So if you have... Uh, just to make sure I understand you. If you have an example like uh, my, my or right, yeah, extends, you know, whatever. The answer is yes. It, it goes up the chain and and looks for those. I think we better should we call it or one more? Yeah. Uh, one more. One more. I suppose uh, it has to be right. Could you repeat the question? Okay. Uh, the answer is complicated. Um, <laughs> it will. What happens is Spring actually looks at your configuration class um, at the bytecode level and reads the methods, looking for the at bean annotations, and says, "Okay, I have a bean definition for this thing." Um, and then the first time that you actually go and access a bean, or when the configuration starts, it will then create it. So it will scan it without creating it, then it will create the, uh, the at configuration class first, and then it will uh, run the bean methods. So by the time you get to actually, if we put a breakpoint in a bean method, yes, your constructor's been called by that point. In XML, you can do the abstract beans, what's the equivalent for... Uh... Abstract classes. No, no, but I mean, beans 
Oh, I see. You, you, um, so the question is, uh, I can define things uh, like abstract beans in, in the XML where I can put common configuration and then have a couple of lighter weight sub bean definitions that inherit it. Uh, what's the equivalent in Java config? And the answer is to use the standard kind of Java technique. So you could have a, you could have a protected method, say, that defines the commonality and then have two public bean methods that just go and call that uh, protected method to set up the, the common stuff. You have to, yeah. Thank I think, you. Yeah, we'll, we'll be around, I guess, for the next, like, 15 minutes or so. Oh. So if there's any questions that we didn't cover or if anything you didn't understand, just uh, come up to us. And thanks, Josh, for hey, Thank you, Phil. It was me. so much fun. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. And I hope you enjoyed the show.